Welcome to the pollinator tour on the uh, virtual Milan no-till field day. My name is Michael McCord. I'm a private lands biologist with the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency and uh, today I'm going to be talking about part of the work I do on a fairly regular basis uh, working with landowners and in particular today how we go about trying to improve the habitat on farms for, uh, for pollinators. So pollinators the classic example we think of are monarch butterflies and honeybees, uh, but really there are hundreds and hundreds of species that perform this very important ecosystem function uh, across Tennessee. Uh, for example, our squash are, and uh, other curcubits are pollinated by a small ground nest solitary bee that lives in the ground at the base of the plants, uh, not a, an insect that really many of us really think about. but some of the big groups we think about, the classic ones are the butterflies and moths and the bees, but also beetles, flies, uh, and even some, uh, some birds and uh, mammals, bats for example, can all be important pollinators for various species uh, of plants. Uh, and if we're thinking about our backyard vegetable garden, it can be really handy to have some of this habitat close by because while we may not uh, in addition to the pollinator benefit, we can also get the benefit of having some predatory beneficial insects that are able to have a, a long-term established population in that cover nearby. So why does, a ten why does the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency and why do biologists care, care about pollinators? Uh, pollinators are important to producing the fruit and seed crops that a lot of our species of wildlife consume. And when we're talking about our bird species, most of our bird species for the first month of life, their diet is 90 plus percent insects because they're, the young are growing very rapidly, they're growing out lots of feathers, so they need lots of protein. And really, for as far as wild foods go that are easily accessible and digestible for for small birds, it's hard to come up with a better protein source than insects. And 89% of our birds, they, they feed on insects. Just a very, very small percentage of birds are actually true uh, herbivores. Uh, and really, the, where we're seeing our declines, and I think this is really where the rubber hits the road for grassland songbirds, for quail, uh, and for monarch butterflies and other native pollinators is that our pollinator habitat has been largely converted to other land uses. We have lost 97 percent of the native grasslands in the U.S. to some other land use, uh, whether that's development uh, for housing or uh, retail or industry, whether that's conversion and abandonment and allowing that to succeed into a, a forest cover type, or whether that's conversion uh, to agriculture, we have lost 97% of our grasslands and it's really, it's going to be really difficult to manage and have a, a successful ecosystem when it's basically operating at 3% function. I know whenever I get down to 3% battery life on my phone, I'm looking to plug it in and charge that back up, but we really haven't uh, had that same push and that same concern for our native grasslands uh, in the U.S. Uh, Thirty-five percent, so basically a third of our worldwide crop production depends on insect pollination. Uh, and in Tennessee, when we start breaking that down, we have two billion, uh, uh, two million in apple production, squash, and some of the other specialty crops. Uh, vegetable crops are about a million dollars. Uh, honey is a, is becoming more popular every year, and my my nine hundred eighteen thousand dollars of honey production is probably a little bit dated now, uh, but you know, berry production, uh, tomatoes, uh, even though tomatoes can self-pollinate, especially the small cherry tomatoes can certainly uh, benefit from a little buzz by a bumblebee to help move that pollen around. Uh, so what about the native insects? You know, we're seeing, everybody's concerned about colony collapse disorder in honeybees, but we're seeing the same thing with our native pollinators. And like I mentioned earlier, 97% of our habitat has, has either been destroyed or has been degraded. So uh, we're seeing those same declines in the species that depended on those native grasslands. 
Uh, we see uh, summer foraging, you know, the, the nectar and the pollen, but also overwintering cover and a lot of the, the hollow stems of the grasses. You know, what, what, where it really comes down, you know, for all of us is, you know, honeybees are an introduced species. Uh, they, they produce, they, they do a lot of ecosystem benefit for us over here with pollination. They produce honey. But ultimately, if we lost honeybees, our native bees could still fill that niche if we protect our native bees and our native pollinators and provide the habitat they need. So whenever I'm planning a habitat restoration, the first thing I do is I'm going to evaluate the site. I'm looking at the soil types. Uh, a lot of that happens in the field, but also using the USDA's Web Soil Survey website. Uh, I want to match the plant to the site as best I can if I'm doing a planting. Uh, I, want to, I want to also look at the slope. If I'm doing a really steep site, I may have to do some other things uh, as far as making sure I'm doing no-till to conserve that soil resource, minimize that erosion because the, the worst thing I can do is go in and try to do something in the name of wildlife and end up dumping a big plume of silt in the creek and killing off a different species of wildlife. I want to think about the moisture regime on the site. Uh, once again, matching, this, matching the plants to the site is very important. Uh, I want to evaluate my seed bank. So there's two different components to the seed bank. There's the species that I want and the species I don't want. If, for example, I'm wanting to do something from, for monarch butterflies, uh, common milkweed, frankly, is very common in the seed bank. So if I can manage for common milkweed, and it's going to come in on my site anyways, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense for me to go and spend a considerable amount of money to plant the stuff when I, when I know, because I've studied my, my seed bank response, uh, what I'm going to get. The other side of it is, is I can have some really nasty invasive species that can make it very difficult for me to manage my pollinator planting long term. Uh, things like Bermuda grass and Ceresia lespedeza can commonly come in after I've done my first site prep, even if I didn't know they were there, they may have been suppressed. So if I, if I, if I, give, my, if I give my seed bank time to respond and show me what it's got in it, I can, I can, if I'm planting, I can put together a better mix, and if I'm not planting, I can, uh, I can make sure I get rid of that stuff I definitely don't want before I go to the, uh, before I, I get too, too far down that road. I also need to take into a account existing cover. Uh, if I'm going into a, a, a pasture field or, or something that's in existing turf, my site prep for that is going to be completely different than if I'm going into a, a wooded site and trying to take wood, uh, a patch of woods back to an early successional uh, plant community. So one question that we always want to skip over is do I even need to plant? Uh, the site on this screen right here is a site in Bledsoe County and uh, one of the first things I asked this landowner is like, hey, when did you plant this field and how long has it been going? Because you've got a really nice stand of Coreopsis here. And his answer was, I never planted anything. All I've done is I disc this thing uh, in the fall or the winter and I get a great stand of flowers coming back every year. Now, one thing that I would probably, if I w would like to improve here, might be the diversity, uh, because when I've got just one or two species of flowers, my window of flowering and the window of foraging for my pollinator in pollinating insects is going to be relatively narrow. Uh, but I'm not going to do it here. If I'm going to do a planting, I'm going to move it somewhere else, because I'd be a fool to mess up a field that had uh, this good of a stand and this good of a cover uh, for my other species of wildlife like deer and turkeys and rabbits and quail that will also benefit uh, from these pollinator uh, plantings. And here's a couple other examples of, of fields that we have not planted. Uh, this is uh, Bridgestone Firestone Wildlife Management Area in White County, Tennessee. Uh, this site was a pine plantation and all that was done is the pines were harvested at the end of the rotation and it's just been burned since then. Uh, another picture from Bridgestone Firestone. 
And what we do there is we just vary our fire rotation so we have uh, different parts of that area that are uh, flowering and being disturbed at different times. So my recommendation always is to manage by subtraction first. Get rid of the stuff you know you don't want, the, no, the stuff you know you need rid of. Evaluate the seed bank and then, and only then, are we going to go in and start trying to add stuff back. And once again, we're managing for diversity. That is, if you take nothing else away from this presentation, the most important thing that we want to really harp on is diversity. So, uh, you know, we've got plenty of introduced grasslands. Uh, having a native grassland, even if it's small on your property, uh, is diversity that you don't have. Uh, but we're also thinking about diversity in bloom period, so we want things to bloom early uh, and all the way into the end of the summer. And then we want to, you know, maybe use some of our traditional uh, forage plantings like our clovers maybe to add some, uh, some additional foraging windows. We can also do that through some of our native shrubs. Some of the crab apples, uh, elderberry, things like that. We can provide some alternative forage in, at some different times. We want diversity in the color of the flowers. Different colors and different flower structures attract different pollinators. Uh, we want structural uh, in the height of the plants. We want variation and diversity there. Uh, for the other species of wildlife, the insects, they really it really makes no difference whether that flower is two feet tall or ten feet off the ground to the, to the insects for their foraging, but when it comes to winter cover uh, for, for them to, to hibernate in and also winter cover for other species of wildlife we might be interested in like grassland songbirds, it becomes very important. And once again, we're going to use, if we're planting, we're going to be planting to supplement what we got out of our native seed bank. Uh, once again, maximizing diversity with cool season and warm season native and I'm very I'm very cautious before I do any introduced species. If I'm doing introduced species I'm pretty much stick, sticking to species that are naturalized like the clovers. Uh, I don't want to be the guy who turns the next kudzu uh, loose on the landscape. Uh, don't try to manicure your habitat. That's one thing that you know we, we can it's a slippery slope. We, we like a lot of people like these pollinator patches because they're pretty, but we're not planting flower beds. We're planting patches of cover that just happen to have some flowers on them. So don't fall in the temptation of thinking you've got to mow these things. If you're going to go in and do a disturbance, have an intended management outcome from it. Uh, you know, diversity, here's a, an example I had at my house. Uh, as soon as I brought this uh, blueberry plant out of the bed of my truck, I went in the basement to get a shovel and come back out and there was already a bumblebee working the flowers, which I certainly appreciate that and he certainly appreciated having the, uh, the flowers to work. Uh, once again, uh, an annual clover patch. I do something very similar on my backyard garden. I, I do a cover crop on my backyard garden every winter and I normally let that crimson clover and those uh, turnips go, go to flower. And then my, I'm getting some flowering on the landscape at a time of the year where there's not a whole lot for insects otherwise. So when we start thinking about the scale, uh, you know, if you're doing something in a raised bed or a flower bed, uh, you know, the square foot scale can certainly be beneficial for insects. But if we're wanting to do something for wildlife, uh, Acres is always better and more is always better. Uh, but something we always need to think about when we're planning this is the long-term goals. I have a lot of people that come in, call me up and want to do this, but they don't have the capability to manage this stuff long-term. Uh, whether that's spot spraying out invasives or whether that's doing some sort of disturbance, whether it's disking or burning or uh, spraying out trees. Uh, we need to make sure that we're equipped and, and you're fully prepared to take on that responsibility because the worst thing we can do, uh, I, I don't want to go down the road of doing all this work and then you get three or four years into this and decide that it's more than you want to take on and you turn it back into a hay field uh, or it goes back into 
crop or we let it go into trees and we did some great work but we spent a lot of money to get there and we did a, used a lot of effort to get there just to, uh, to lose that and go back to something else. So just a, a typical scenario here that I encounter and most of the time we're doing these in a, a pasture or turf grass situation. I like to spray late fall if I'm not planting or late summer if I've already just made the decision to plant. Uh, that way I can kill, get a good kill on my turf grasses. Uh, there's other options you can use, but generally if we're doing anything of very much size, we're going to be doing chemical site prep. Wait, give that seed bank a chance to flush out. Uh, yeah, ideally, I'd give it at least one growing season before I considered planting to see what was going to come back. Spot treat that as needed. You know, there's going to be sericea, there's going to be Bermuda grass, there may be Johnson grass. Uh, you know, there's going to be stuff that you don't want to come back. There'll probably be a lot of stuff that you do want to come back. So just take your time with that. Uh, and here's a site we were doing a buffer around a sinkhole. And uh, we've got a pretty good kill. We didn't want to kill right there where the throat was. We were going to, you know, we'd tolerate some cool season grasses in there because we were going to have uh, the, the livestock out. So if you're planting, you got a couple of different options. You can do a top sowing or you can do a, a no-till drill. I generally try to avoid uh, tillage just because the erosion issues. It always seems like I get a big flush of stuff that I don't want uh, when I'm doing tillage. So some things that we've used when we're doing broadcast, uh, pelletized lime, cracked corn, sunflower seed, fertilizer, sand, some things to mix the seed with because when you're doing four or five pounds of seed per acre, it's really easy to not get that spread evenly and get a quarter acre in and run out of seed. So we don't want to do that. We want to make sure that seed goes over the acre because it's not cheap and you're going to have to order it. You're not going to be able to just run out and pick up an extra sack at the co-op. Uh, if I'm doing conventional tillage, I just want to just barely mash it in. I don't want to bury it. I want to treat it basically like clover in that regard. Uh, ideal seeding dates. I did some in my backyard starting in late February this year and I've got a pretty darn good stand. Uh, but we, we try to get those in before the end of May because the weather just generally, a lot of times we'll, we'll get a, a hot dry spell sometime in June and it can hurt our germination. Uh, and with some of these species, that frosting, uh, can, that, that frost on the, on the seed can help break dormancy. So here we're using a, a little no-till drill to put some of this in. Uh, be patient. Uh, the first year, it's probably going to look like a weed patch. That's why I normally cheat and throw some, bird, some, some, some common sunflower in. It's going to give me some color that first year. Might keep the wife off my back a little bit because she's got something pretty to look at. Keep the neighbors off my back from asking me to bush hog down that weed patch if there's something in there for them to look at. Uh, these native plants, though, they're going to generally focus on root growth first because they're in it for the long game. Uh, they're drought ad uh, adapted, so root overshoot is, de is generally the, the drought ad uh, adaptation strategy. Uh, but just be patient. Uh, and now, once we've got an established stand, what do we do? Uh, mowing can be a tool, uh, but we don't want to mow just for the sake of mowing. You know, one of the reasons that we like to do a pollinator patch is it, gets us, it gives us a reason to not do recreational mowing because if we're mowing that when the flowers are on, number one, our pollinators aren't going to get used to the flowers. We won't get to see the flowers because we're going to be chopping them up. And our wildlife is nesting at that time of the year and we'll be chopping up their nests. If I'm going to burn, my ideal windows are either uh, before April or then again a late growing season burn. Late growing season burn can be really useful. It really helps stimulate uh, the forb component, the broadleaf, the flowering plants. I'm going to spray out the weeds as they pop in. Uh, here we've got a strip and a planting we did of Sericea lespedeza. We missed this strip when we did our site prep spraying. So what I did is I just went back in with my ATV sprayer and I just zapped that stuff, just sprayed, sprayed out the stuff I didn't want and I got I, I killed some of the stuff I planted, but I have to get rid of that sericea. I can't let that go. Uh, 
and we, we can also use selective herbicides so a lot of times I'll plant these just with with broadleaf plants just with forbs so I can use a pro I can use a product such as clethodum just to spray the grasses out because a lot of times grass pressure will be pretty heavy so I know a lot of folks get nervous when we're spraying about around pollinators uh, and I think another one of the presenters is going to cover this in more detail but we can spray when the pollinators are less active and plants are not in bloom. You know, generally the most effective weed control comes before that weed is a weed problem. We scout our, our problem weeds early. If we, let them, if we let that Johnson grass get thigh high and we say, oh crap, I got to spray, it's probably too late to get a good kill on that Johnson grass. So be active, be early. You get in there before it's a problem. You're also going to be in there before a lot of your bloom's on and before the bees are really in there working it hard. Uh, organic isn't always pollinator friendly. There's a lot of organic insecticides. Organic insecticides are not selective. They'll kill our bees just as well as they'll kill something that we want rid of. So just keep that in mind. And you know, if we're doing this at a small scale, a lot of times habitat next to our vegetables uh, can boost our pollination, get us better production, and also give us some protection from those beneficial insects. Uh, there's a variety of programs that are available out there in the Farm Bill to help put uh, habitat on the ground. The three main ones are the EQIP program, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, CSP, that's a Conservation Stewardship Program, and the CRP, Conservation Reserve Program. Uh, the good thing about CSP and EQIP is we can do uh, basically any cover type in those programs we can put pollinator habitat on. We can make improvements for them on those. CRP uh, generally requires uh, cropping history or uh, it being a buffer along a waterway. Uh, without getting too far down in the weeds here, each program has its own set of requirements and its own uh, cost share and incentive payments. So what I would recommend is if this is something you think you want to pursue, whether you want to pursue it through programs or not, reach out to your local NRCS service center or a habitat biologist with TWRA or Quail Forever. These folks do this stuff on a daily basis. Uh, for example, I have 22 counties I cover and I have landowners in 22 counties that are doing very similar things to this. So I've got 22 counties worth of successes and failures uh, so we know the pitfalls, we know the ins and outs, and we, can, we know what, what species will do well in your area. And we can help work, work you through that process. Once we've got you, you know, once we develop a conservation plan with you, then we're ready to start talking programs. We want to make sure that, that we've got a good way forward and a good plan to put this on the ground. Here is how you get in contact with us, uh, tnwildlife-habitat.com. If you'll scroll down, you'll see the private lands management and assistance, and we've got a map here with all the contact information and the areas covered by our various uh, TWRA and Quail Forever biologists. And just below that, you'll find the contact information for uh, NRCS service centers. But really, as we're going through this process, we're going to make sure that they're involved and you know them. Uh, we want to make sure we help you build a good technical service team so you can get all your questions answered. And now I've got a little short video in my backyard of some habitat work that I've done there for, uh, that might be helpful for some folks that uh, I want to try this out on a small scale and uh, just get their toes wet in it. All right, so let's step away from the PowerPoint for a minute. and. Uh, talk about a little bit of a, a backyard project that I've had going on. So this is my little backyard pollinator patch. It doesn't look like much now, but uh, I'm starting to get my first flowers of the year. Got some black-eyed Susans, some Coreopsis, and I threw a few bird seed sunflowers in. I mean, who doesn't like sunflowers? But the process that I went through here is I started out by killing the turf where I wanted to plant. I just sprayed it. Uh, I feel like I get much better control with herbicide than I do with tillage. And I did that in mid-August of last year. Even though we were in a pretty bad drought, uh, I got a really good kill on that. 
I came back about a month and a half later because that was the first time we got any rain and threw down some crimson clover in early October. And that's what these dried out heads are here. They've gone to seed. Uh, and I simply came behind the crimson clover and I broadcast my wildflower seed into it in February. And now the uh, wildflower seed is coming up through and taking the place of the clover. And I can see some partridge pea here. I can see some, uh, cori some more coreopsis in here, some uh, biden, some stick tights. And the way I'm managing my weeds here, it's a pretty small patch, is to just come along and pull them when I see something I don't want. Like uh, mare's tail, for example. We've got one right over here. pull that dude out by the root and that one's done for. So, uh, you know, we don't have to work within the, the programs necessarily. The, the timelines on the programs may not work well for your timeline. So uh, I would encourage you if this is something you think you want to do, uh, this is kind of what it's going to look like the first little bit, but uh, just get out there and do it.